great pleasure that I introduce the first speaker, Dr. Eric Schoen, who's Professor of Genetics and Development at Columbia University. <laughs> Eric and I go back a long way. We've been collaborators in very interesting projects in the past. We were involved a little bit in the cloning of Dolly. And um, he's fearless and uh, courageous in going to areas that other people have tried to venture and tried to resolve. But I think that Eric is one of the more creative and innovative scientists that I know. And you should know that he's doing really pioneering work in Alzheimer's disease. So it's really appropriate that he's speaking, even though on a different topic, it's speaking in this uh, Neuroscience Institute. Eric is also a great teacher. And one of the few people who I know who in 45 minutes is going to teach you everything you want to know about genetics. So after you take, listen to his lecture, apply for a PhD, and you'll be in good shape. So well, let's welcome Dr. Eric Schoen. Good morning. And I want to thank John for inviting me and for the organizers. With that kind of an introduction, I don't think you need the 45 minutes. You can get the PhD right now. <laughs> Okay, so my tech, you can all hear me. So my task, as I see it, is to uh, be the appetizer for the next few days to set the table for what is to follow. An underlying scientific basis for some of the things you're going to hear. I obviously cannot cover everything, but we'll try most of those things. And I want to divide the talk first into some basic concepts of biology, which many of you know, but maybe some in the audience don't. Then I'll talk a little bit about technology and we'll end with a, actually an interesting problem that has uh, arisen in, in the field of my own field, which I'll tell you about in, a, in about 30 minutes. So why don't we start at the beginning with a cell. And all I want you to know about the cell right now is that, uh, aside from the source of genetics, there are two places in the cell where DNA resides and DNA being the basic, bio, uh, the basic information in the cell, obviously it resides in the nucleus. It resides in one more place, which is the mitochondrion, and I will tell you about that later. All the rest is commentary. Fundamental, fundamental thinking of, of, uh, in our field is Watson and Crick's famous <coughs> central dogma of molecular biology. Almost everybody knows this. DNA, which is a stable source of information in the cell, encodes RNA, this is deoxyribonucleic acid, encodes ribonucleic acid, which is a transient source of information in the cell, which then, and, and is movable, this is immovable, this is movable, and eventually encodes the actual business end of what cells do, which is fundamentally proteins, and via proteins, carbohydrates, fats, and everything else the cell does. This is an iconic figure. You don't hear me. Sorry. Better? Yeah. It's an iconic figure. The double helix has now entered society everywhere. Just to reiterate what the double helix is, it is merely a backbone fundamentally of sugar and phosphate, two backbones that intertwine, and are connected by connectors, which are called the bases, and there are four of them. There are actually five, but the four here are guanine and cytosine, G and C, thymine and adenine, A and T. G, and C, G always goes with C, A always connects to T. You can never have it any other way in, norm in normal situation. That's important because that provides the fundamental base pairing rule, which was the basic insight of Watson and Crick in terms of DNA replication. So this is what it actually looks like in the microscope, at least a little bit of it. You can barely see the double helix, but there it is. And that's what it really looks like when somebody in my laboratory isolates it. You can spool it out of a beaker, and it looks like, uh, well, this is what it looks like. OK do something. Let's try again. Here we go. 
So that's the DNA as you see it in a cartoon. Most people think of DNA in chromosomes that look like this, but actually that's not what it looks like inside the nucleus. Here's the DNA, and there's a huge amount of it. Three billion base pairs in the germline. That means what's called the haploid genome, a single set of chromosomes. In every other cell in the body, six billion base pairs, twice as many, half from the mother, half from the father. And it's all wrapped up, and I'll show you this a little bit more, and it looks like a bowl of spaghetti inside the nucleus. It does not look like this, except under special circumstance. But that's the circumstance that is easiest to spot, and the circumstance we know best. And the reason for that is because how do you put two meters, six billion base pairs is two meters, that stretches from here to there, into a cell that is only a few hundred microns in size, a few hundred uh, micrometers. So it's spooled up like on a fishing rod. And you can pack an enormous amount of material in a linear version, in one dimension, and put it into three dimensions. So this is two nanometers. That's two billionths of a meter. And then it's spooled around just like this one. It's spooled around proteins that are called histones. And then those wrap among themselves like this. And then those wrap among themselves like this. And you can see we're getting larger and larger. And then this is just a little segment here, OK? And that becomes a segment that's wrapped around again. You are increasing, you are decreasing the volume of the cell, of, of the <laughs> DNA, by a factor of 10,000 when you do this. I mean, it, it's an amazement to see this happen. And that's what they really look like. These are called metaphase chromosomes. And they're actually each chromosome, and the beautiful pictures here of this, each chromosome is actually a duplicate of its sister. These are two sisters that are absolutely identical and are connected in the middle. But remember, when DNA is actually being operated on, it's a single long spaghetti. And there are 23 of them. And here's the first piece of new technology. This is called chromosome painting. You can actually identify each chromosome using special kinds of fluoro, uh, fluorogenic probes, and, uh, which you can see distinguishes one from the other. In the microscope, you can do this. So DNA and the central dogma, the first part of the central dogma is that DNA must be replicated. The basis, the base pairing rules, G always goes to C. A always goes to T, means that if I can take the double helix and unwind it, and I have GTC on this side, and I have a machinery in the cell to create a daughter strand, which would be the red strand, which is being created here by special enzymes, that the next letter here will, will have to be a G. The next letter here will have to be an A. The next letter here will have to be a C. And in fact, therefore, you will be able to use the information of one strand to derive the information on the second strand. So from one strand, I can make two. And by the way, if I did that here again, I could make four. But we only make two in the cell. That's all you need to know about DNA replication. It's stable, it stays inside the nucleus, and never goes anywhere else. However, the cell is much bigger and needs information that is outside the nucleus. And that's created by the RNA. So here's the double strands of the DNA. We separate out the strands, and there's an enzyme that does that, and reads one of the strands. So here we have A, T, C, G, C, G, and so forth. And from that, special enzyme creates, just as if it were a second a complementary template of DNA, this time it's a complementary template of RNA, ribonucleic acid. So now C makes G, G makes C. A does not make T, it makes a related base called U, or uracil. That's the fifth base, by the way. And so now, if you read off the green strand, you make the orange strand. Why? So the first why answer to that is that this piece of RNA is mobile. It can actually escape the nucleus and go into the cytoplasm. The second answer is that DNA is very stable, very resistant to stress. RNA is very unstable and can be degraded rapidly. So the cell has a mechanism to transfer information from one part of the cell to the other, turn it over, and then make something else. 
And in long-lived cells, the RNA may be long-lived. In short-lived cells, it might be short-lived or vice versa. But it's a way to have a dynamic control over information inside the cell. <coughs> so once you've made from the DNA, you've transcribed the RNA, just like a secretary transcribes. Each three letters here, so from the ATG now we have AUG, CGG, and so forth. In a frame of three by three by three, each triplet, which is called a codon, will encode a protein. And a protein is made out of 20 amino acids, one of 20 amino acids. I'm showing you four of them here. And so as you go along this way, you're encoding a physical structure called a protein, which starts with thionine, arginine, tyrosine, leucine. I won't give you the other 16. How does it do that? It uses the famous genetic code. So the genetic code is a way to convert those three letters into the information of the proteins. Since you have a triplet code, and each position in the code, A, T, G, the first position could be any of four letters, A, T, G, or C. The second one could be any of four. The third one could be any of four. Four times four times four. There are 64 possible triplets, and of the 64, 61 of them are used to encode amino acids. Three of them are encoding nothing. That ends the string of letters. And so before I had methionine, arginine, tyrosine, leucine on the previous slide, and here they are, AUG, CGG, UAC, UUA. That's how the genetic code works. And it's done by an incredible machine for which a Nobel Prize was given out last year, and Israel won one-third of that prize up at the Tefmiel. Here's the message. This is an adapter called the transfer RNA. Here are those three letters, let's say ATG. So the mRNA is attached to the adapter, and out of the end of the adapter of the ribosome, which is what this big machine is, and for which the Nobel Prize was given, out come the amino acids. And the amino acids encode a protein. And here's another way of looking at it. They're actually, these ribosomes actually run, sometimes you have multiple ones, and as it's running this way, out is being spewed the protein. And you can actually see that here. These are the ribosomes. There's a real photograph, an uh, electron micrograph, and the proteins are coming out. And as you can see, as you go from here to here, the protein's getting longer and longer. This is the way it actually happens in the cytoplasm. Now, uh, let me drop back to RNA for one minute. What I didn't tell you that is in humans, the gene encoding the RNA is actually in pieces. So this is a part that's going to encode a part of the protein, and here's another part. These are called exons, and another part, and another part. And the green material in the middle is fundamentally non-coding information. So when the gene is transcribed into a messenger RNA, and that's what it is, a message, it actually creates a long precursor RNA, and then the white boxes are thrown away and are edited out. So you go from one to two to three to four and throw away the middle stuff. But sometimes you can make two different versions, one and two and three, here to here to here, skip this, or one and two and four, here to here, skip three, go to four, or you can make one, two, three, four. Right away, one gene here can encode three proteins. One, two, three, four, one, two, four, one, two, three. You can see, therefore, that even though there were 20,000 genes in the human genome, you could have 100,000 proteins, 500,000 proteins. And that creates some of the diversity in the mammalian genome that makes us special. Finally, what's a protein? I could show you hundreds of structures of proteins. This is one that a friend of mine uh, crystallized and identify it. So this is called thyroidox. It's not important what it is. Just to tell you that as the message spews out, it spews out from one end and will go to the other end, just like this, down to here, up to here, around, up, around, down, up, and down, and out. And it folds in its own unique three-dimensional structure. And it's that structure that creates the protein that does what the cell wants it to do. Any disruption in this section, in anywhere, can create a problem. You can maybe appreciate that if I have different exons, one, two, and four, they can actually create modules. 
Maybe exon 1 is creating this part, exon 2, this part, exon 3, this part, exon 4, this part. What if I go 1, 2, 4, I do this and this and this but not this? Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's not so good. But nature has evolved to create many flavors of proteins out of a minimal amount of information. All right, that's all we need to know about biology, the normal biology. So let's talk about when things go wrong because we're going to talk about the next two days when things go wrong. So let's start with the big picture, large-scale chromosome rearrangements of some sort. And I'm only going to talk about two of them. The biggest large-scale chromosome rearrangement one can think of is just getting rid of a chromosome or having too much of a chromosome. And the one I'm picking is called non-disjunction and is actually an example for which uh, Down syndrome is an example. So in the germline, that means in the oocytes of the mother, in the sperm of the father, cells are actually haploid. That means they only have one of the two parental chromosomes. But before that happens, all right, there has to be a duplication of chromosomal material, and that's what this X, that's the classic picture of the, of the, um, of the metaphase chromosome I showed you. One of these will divide and go into the germline, and eventually, at fertilization, this one will go here, and this one will go here. Similarly for the mother, this one will go here, and this one will go here. So, this is a normal fertilized egg, two chromosomes, one from the mother, one from the father. And here's another one. In non-disjunction, which is a terrible word, okay, because it's a double negative, these two, don't divide. They don't come apart. These come apart, but these don't. So this one goes here. This one goes here in fertilization. Excuse me. Right. But here, they didn't separate. So both of them wind up here. And nothing winds up here. This cell is completely unviable and will die. In a few cases, for three, separate, three different chromosomes, of which chromosome 21 is the example, you can have two chromosomes from one parent, one from the other, meaning a trisomy. And for trisomy 21, the child is viable. That child will have Down syndrome. Trisomy 18, other uh, genetic problems. Most trisomies are not viable. Chromosome 21 is. And that's a classic example of a genetic problem. We have no idea why this problem actually increases merely with the age of the, of the mother of the mother. Once a mother passes the age of 35 or 40, the probability of having a child with a non-disjunction event climbs exponentially. And we don't know why. It's an active area of research. Now I told you that in the germline, that in the germline we're separating chromosomes. But before that happens, the chromosomes, in order to have cell division in the germline, you have to double up chromosomes, and eventually we're going to have them later. But after the doubling up, you can have when the, when you can have crossing over between maternal and paternal chromosomes, and this is normal. In fact, it's necessary, and it is the reason when you get this shuffling of similar information. Let me be clear. This chromosome, let's say, is chromosome five. This is also chromosome 5. So these are fundamentally identical chromosomes with similarity all across the way with minor variation. And because they are so similar, because of the base pairing rules, you could have a piece of the orange chromosome actually crossing over and aligning with a piece of the gray chromosome. And when that happens, you get a crossover event such that some of chromosome 5 from the father now winds up on the mother, and reciprocally, some of mother's five winds up on the father's. So when you then go into division and make the new, new baby, the baby looks almost exactly like the parents, but not exactly. If this didn't happen, we would all be clones of each other. But we're not, because this generates the variation that makes me look like my mother and father, but I don't look like my mother and father. That's outside and inside. How does that happen? It's a wonderful process. This is actually a cartoon 
of a crossover junction. It's called a holiday junction. Uh, two L's. It's not the holiday. It's, it's Robin Holiday who discovered this. And here's a beautiful picture of a holiday junction before resolution. And then you cut, and then you can see that you can bring together two different dissimilar pieces, maternal and paternal, together on the same chromosome in a reciprocal way. So, because we know this now, besides having extra chromosomes or fewer chromosomes, you can now begin to exchange chromosomes. I told you that recombination occurs between homologous chromosomes, maternal chromosome 5, paternal chromosome 5. But in fact, there are areas on every chromosome that have regions of similarity or homology one to the other. So here on chromosome A, let's call that chromosome 2, and here on chromosome B, let's call that chromosome 11, there might be a small region right here where there's a long enough region of similarity that just by accident, instead of crossing over with its homologous pair, it crosses over with a non-homologous pair, meaning A crossing over to B. And now you've brought a piece of the orange to here and a piece of the purple to here. All right? This is not good. You don't want that. Sometimes you, it happens and it doesn't matter because only 1% or less of the genome actually encodes proteins. 99% does not. So if the breakpoint happens, if you will, in a gene desert, probably not that important. But if it happens in a gene, big time problem. And one of the classic causes of cancer is exactly this. It's co actually called the Philadelphia chromosome from where it was discovered. What is more normal is a micro crossover, not between chromosomes, but inside of chromosomes. Just as there are regions of similarity from one chromosome to the next, there are also regions of similarity inside the chromosome itself. And so then you can have what's called a copy number variation. So normally, here's a region of DNA on the maternal and paternal chromosome. All right. This region of DNA might have a region of similarity somewhere else such that the junction, that holiday junction, it will be a folding over. And now you will duplicate a region of the genome. This and this are now identical. Or the other way around. You can actually lose this information. And now there will be a, a missing part here. This is called copy number variation. As with the crossing over the big orange and purple chromosomes, if the variation is in a gene desert, probably not important. If the variation is, not, is within a gene somewhere, it probably is important. But because this is normally homologous to this, if this is not a gene, this isn't a gene. And therefore, the intra-chromosomal copy number variation is probably not that bad all the time. This has only been discovered in the last three years. Here is a single person. You don't have to read anything. All you have to know is has been mapped for all the copy number variation from the chromosomes, going from 1 to 22. You can see they're all over the place. Everybody in this room has copy number variation, and everybody in this room has variation that's different from everybody else in this room, as far as we can tell. And yet, presumably, we're all normal. Or are we? What is normal, anyway? Okay, those are large-scale uh, differences. Let's talk about small problems. Now we get to things that people are a little more, more familiar with. First, what are called missense mutations, all right? I already told you triplets, the CAT for the simplicity. CAT encodes the amino acid histidine. So yeah, histidine, 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 and so forth. This is polyhistidine, pretty simple protein, actually. But for the sake of the discussion, it's easy to spot. And if I get an A turning into a C through some kind of a change, ultraviolet radiation can do that. X-rays can do that. Something you eat can do this. And just the natural course of daily life can do this. Even going out in the sun. So now I have an A becomes a C. So I have C-A-T, 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 C-C-T. That's proline. Totally different amino acid. 
and therefore now you have an incorrect amino acid, that does not mean you can make a problem. Maybe proline is fine. We have no idea. If you have a disease, however, you know that having a conversion of histidine and proline is going to be a problem. And is the, one of the earliest discoveries in genetics, in fact, was the sickle cell gene, was exactly this kind of a mutation. All right? That's a missense mutation. You can also get a nonsense mutation. Remember, 64 codons, 61 amino acids, three encoding nothing. Those are the stop codons. Well, here we go. Now we have polyglutamine. All right, CAG, 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 CAG. And now we get a C to T change. And TAG is one of those three stop codons. So now we have glutamine, 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 and then it stops. The chain falls out of the ribosome, is exported out into the cytoplasm, uh, is in the cytoplasm, and now creates a truncated protein that's cut off at the site of the stop. Obviously, everything below it is missing. This is probably not good. I can't think of a stop codon mutation that is not pathogenic. There must be a few. Are, and if they are, they're probably way down at the far end of the protein. If you're at the beginning of the protein, you're in big trouble for an important protein. In addition to changing bases, you can add and delete letters. Here's a case where we're going to add a letter. So now, GCT encodes alanine, serine, isoleucine, arginine, arginine. These are amino acids. We stick in an extra letter. Just a reading error by the machinery drops in an extra G. And now we throw the whole thing out of frame. We still have alanine and serine, but instead of reading ATA here, we dropped in the G, and the ribosome does not understand that there should be an ATA. It understands GAT, or GAU actually, and puts in aspartic acid. And then, of course, everything's out of frame below it. Now instead of reading ATA, it reads ACG, which is threonine instead of arginine, and now alanine instead of another arginine. You can see the whole thing's moved over. Obviously, I can do the same thing by taking out one letter, and then I have the same frame shift error. And normally what happens down the road is a stop codon comes in that was out of frame, that was out of frame, is now in frame, and stops it. I think you can appreciate that if I add or insert one letter or two letters, I will make a frame shift mutation. If I add or insert three letters, then it's not so bad anymore because it's like adding a whole codon. And sometimes adding or dropping three letters will not create such a big problem as adding or dropping two letters or one letter. All right, let's talk about inheritance. Everybody knows this, right? One in four, one in four, that's the, the light motif of bioethics and genetics, right? One in four. So autosomal, what is autosomal? Those are the chromosomes that are not the sex chromosomes. Chromosomes one through 22, not X or Y. I don't want to talk about sex linked inheritance, it's a little too complicated. So both parents in autosomal recessive diseases are, are normal, phenotypically. That means what you see, to the eye, they are normal, but both of them are carrying a mutation in the gene. We have no idea what the mutation is. And if the father, remember, provides one of these chromosomes and the mother provides one of them, one child will inherit the two yellows, one child will inherit the two blues, and two children will inherit a yellow and a blue and a yellow and a blue. These three children will be normal, phenotypically normal, to the eye. Genotypically, only one of them is normal. This child who's inherited two normal chromosomes. This one will be affected. These two will be carriers. They will be normal just like their parents were. That's autosomal recessive inheritance. The inheritance of a mutation where the child has to have two errors, one on each chromosome from both parents, and where both parents are carrying one of the mutations and both parents are normal. Quote normal. Autosomal dominant inheritance is a little bit different. Now, only one of the parents carries the mutation, and that parent is affected, has the disease. And now, the mother, in this case, has no, has no mutations, 
And so now when you separate out the, the, the chromosomes, this chromosome goes to here and to here. And of course, the mother provides to here and to here. And you have two normal children and two abnormal children. Okay? But probably at birth, they'll be OK. If you think about it for a minute, and we're going to discuss that. So dominant inheritance, one parent affected, the other parent usually not affected. In the children, instead of one in four, it's one in two. Two affected children on average, two unaffected children on average. But what do we really mean by this, dominant recessive? What, what, at the cellular level, what's going on? And so instead of showing it to you in a picture, this is the most verbose slide I have. Because I didn't really know how to say this better. Let's take a recessive disease. Tay-Sachs is a classic. Thank God we do not have a whole lot of Tay-Sachs uh, in the Jewish community anymore. Recessive disease, meaning it encodes an enzyme. The enzyme happens to be called beta hexosaminidase. It's not important. When a parent has, let's say, when a body has 10 units, if you will, of this hexosaminidase enzyme, the cell runs fine. But guess what? The cell could run just as well on five units. It doesn't need 10 units. Five units is enough. So if a father is mutated for the gene on one chromosome and has the other chromosome, the father has five units. The mother, she has five units. The children, the two normal children will have the, the one who is homozygous normal, the two yellow on the chromosome, will have 10 units. She's fine. The two carrier children will both have five units. And they're fine. The child who's affected has zero units. He has trouble with beta hexosaminidase. He will get, he or she will get t -sacks. That's because there's a loss of function of the enzyme. It's out. In a dominant disease, and familial Alzheimer's is the one I am working on, things are a little bit different because there are really two possibilities. One is a gain of function. The gene, and it doesn't matter what the gene is, has a mutation, and all of a sudden, instead of doing what it's supposed to do, it's doing a new thing. And the new thing may interfere with the life of the cell. Therefore, it doesn't matter whether you have another chromosome with an enzyme doing the right thing, because now you have an enzyme doing the wrong thing. And that is dominant and is harming the cell no matter how much of this good stuff you have. Alternatively, maybe half as much, in this case, Instead, 10 units is, not enough, is enough? No, 10 units is what you need. And if you have only five units, it's not enough. That's called haploinsufficiency. Half as much is not enough. You need 10 units. So if you're born with five units, you're going to have the disease. I think you can appreciate now why recessive genes usually affect babies, children. Because the parents are carrying a hidden mutation they grow up to be functionally normal. And when you get the loss of function, the, child's bio the child is affected right away. And the child normally dies. But in a dominant disease, because the parent is affected, the parent has to get old enough to be able to have children, meaning has to be past the age of 15 or 20. And in our society, they get to the age of 30, 35, 40, pass on the gene, and the gene mutation is functionally silent for the first 5, 10, 15 years. In the case of Alzheimer's, silent for 50 years. And then the disease happens. So you get old enough to pass on the gene. All right, let's talk about some technology. <coughs> DNA sequencing is a technology that has, is 20, oh God, 30 years old now. Because I started doing this a long time ago. Uh, but I didn't start doing it with a machine like this, which costs a few hundred thousand dollars. We have one in our, in our laboratory. My dissertation was sequencing 10,000 bases of DNA. It took me three years. This can be done in half an hour on this machine. It's very humbling. You, too, can be replaced by a machine. And this machine, the DNA is in here. There's a whole magic business in there. And out comes this chromatogram. Four different colors, green, red, black, and blue, the four letters, and you just read it. Powerful technology, the Human Genome Project used these machines, hundreds of them, to sequence the human genome. It costs $3 billion. Today, a genome can be sequenced for 10 
$1,000, and we're on our way to the $1,000 genome, which means in my lifetime, meaning I think in the next 10 years actually, no child will leave the hospital without having a little card or a little chip or something that has his entire genome listed before he leaves the hospital or she leaves the hospital. Think about that. Once you know the genome, now you can do something really magical, which is called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. If you want to take a little bit of a gene and actually have enough to work with, you don't have to go through the entire gyration of trying to clone and isolate DNA anymore. You take a little piece. You've all watched CSI on TV. This is they do in about 10 seconds. It actually takes a little bit longer, three hours. You take a piece of DNA, and if you know something about the DNA, you can actually do an artificial DNA replication. That's all it is. And for one template, you can make two of them, just like I told you. But now these two, I can do it again and make four and eight and 16 and 32. And every cycle only takes 10 minutes. In three hours, I can start from one copy and make billions. With billions, that's enough to work with. I can actually physically see the DNA, play with it, sequence it, cut it, paste it, you who knows what. I'll give you the who knows what in a few minutes. One of the things you can do is analyze the whole genome. This is a magical technology that's about 10 years old now called microarrays. There are 20,000 genes. I can represent each of those 20,000 genes by a little piece of DNA taken from one little edge of the, of the gene, and it's unique. And I can stick it in a well. It's like a little hair sticking up. And because it's about 30 or 40 bases long, it's unique to a single RNA. So here's one RNA. Let's call that the hexosaminidase gene. Here's another RNA. Let's call that the thyroidoxin gene. It doesn't really matter. And now, I can take RNA from a single source, let's say a normal person, and I can color it. I can, with a fluorescent dye, I can make it green. And now I can take all that RNA and pour it over this slide, and because of the complementarity rules, if the RNA is present here, it will light up in that very little uh, well where, and then light up green where the RNA is present. So if I have a pattern of green wells, and I know what genes are here, I know what genes were in there. I can take another sample. Let's say it's a tumor from a cancer patient. From the identical tissue, here's normal kidney, here's a kidney tumor. And I can color it red. And if I did the red alone, I would only get a pattern of red wells, saying those are the RNAs there. But if I mix the two in the wells and then do the analysis, red and green in the microscope are yellow. So these wells here represent RNAs, let's say hexosaminidase here, thyroidoxin here, that are present in both the normal tissue and the tumor tissue. But here is an RNA that's present in the normal but not in the tumor. Here's an RNA that's present in the tumor but not in the normal. And this now, this is a real picture, this is a cartoon, this now becomes a fingerprint of the tumor. Of the 10,000 genes, let's say, that are being expressed in the tumor, 8,000 are, are yellow, but maybe 500 are red, and 1,500 are green, and somewhere in there, if I do this enough times, I can begin to narrow down and say, aha, maybe these are the really important genes in tumors uh, that we can now focus our attention on. This microarray technology is really micro. That's a shekel. That's where the chip sits when you stick it in the machine to do the colors. Now, I talked about base pair changes, and I made you sound like they're all bad. Most of them are not bad. Everybody in this room has base pair changes, and they're all over the genome. And usually they are single nucleotide polymorphisms. A polymorphism is a fancy way of saying mutation. Mutation does not mean bad. Mutation means different. So here, instead of a T, there's a G. Instead of an A, there's a C. And here are 10 people from all over the world, and they have different variants. We can use these variations 
in order to look for disease genes that we don't know anything about. You remember the idea of crossing over in the germline. This is a normal process, right? If I have a marker, and a marker means any variation, and in my case, it's going to be a single nucleotide polymorphism, and the markers are all across the chromosome, A, B, C, D, E. And let's say somewhere in there is a disease gene. One marker is very far apart from the disease gene. One marker is very close to the disease gene. And the degree of distance between the marker and the disease gene corresponds to how often the marker travels with the gene. What do I mean by that? I have a stick here. I put pressure on the stick. If I put pressure on the stick, the stick's going to break, right? Here is marker B. Here is marker E, just by crossing over. Where is the disease gene? here because it is so close to D and the E that the probability of D and E breaking in this little tiny area is very small and I can do it again right and if I still look for marker E and it's still traveling with the disease I know the disease is here and I've already thrown away three quarters of that chromosome this is the area of interest and I do it again and still, it doesn't break. I've eliminated 90% of the chromosome. And this is how the genetic analysis is done, looking for specific SNPs that are always inherited at the same in the disease. If a SNP is not inherited in disease, you will not, it's not relevant. The SNP does not cause the disease. The SNP is merely an indication that the disease gene is nearby. And once we've narrowed it down as far as we can, and you can do this with microarrays, instead of tumor and non-tumor, patients and non-patients, right? Here's the, the people with the disease, and the SNP-B is traveling with them, and SNP-B was thrown away through these recombination events in the germline in pedigrees and families of people who do and don't have the disease. And then you can draw what's called a Manhattan plot. Since I'm from Columbia, I'm very proud of this. You line up all the chromosomes, 1 to 21 to 22. And now with the mathematics of this analysis, this is nothing more than a mathematical analysis. You get the probability that the SNP is inherited with the disease. And here, as you travel down, in this particular case, three genes were inherited in this pedigree very strongly. And these now, I'm sorry, SNPs were inherited where the genes nearby now become candidates for mutations for a specific disease. Then the hard work starts, as opposed to this previous stuff, which you don't think was hard work. Of course it was. And then the, the really hard work starts of finding the mutation. So, the next few minutes, what else is new? Epigenetics. The next big thing from the Greek, meaning over or above, meaning there are, besides the information in the <coughs> DNA itself, there's a new layer of information stuck on top of the genome. And it's two kinds of layers of information. They're both a way of marking the genome instead of with a fluorescent tag. Now we have a chemical tag. It's called a methyl group, and it's stuck on the DNA. Or you can actually stick it on the histones, those, remember that fishing rod um, protein. So you can mark it here, you can mark it here. This is normal, and when it's normal, on chromosomes, you can mark, mark, put marks on specific regions of the chromosome. For example, on chromosome 15, there's a small region, small meaning a few million bases, where the, one, the, paternal region, the paternal genome can be marked, and the maternal genome is not marked, and right nearby, the other way around. The maternal is marked, the paternal is not marked. In that case, if you have a chromosomal deletion of the region, all right? And what you delete is the region that, when I say marked, what I mean is that the gene on the unmarked region is on, and the gene on the marked region, which is called now an imprinted region, is off. The imprint shuts down the RNA transcription. So if I happen to delete the on, all I'm left with is the off. And if I'm off, I got nothing. 
It's recessive. If you delete the paternal gene, you get a disease called Prader-Willi syndrome, and this is a child with Prader-Willi. They have an insatiable appetite. Parents have to lock the refrigerators. At the almost nearby, you can delete the other side. The maternal gene is on. The paternal gene is off. If you delete the maternal gene, again, nothing's happening. And you now get what's called Angelman syndrome, sometimes called happy puppet syndrome, as you can see why. For years, this was a mystery. How could you delete the same large area on chromosome 15, get two totally different diseases? And now we know why. This is only about five years old, this understanding. That's the normal situation. There's another normal situation, but it's not conserved. And that is that the epigenetic marks are put on in real time. As we are speaking, as we are sitting here, epigenetic marks are being put on and off the chromosomes. They are being marked by environmental and physiological stimuli. Truth be told, we really do not understand what they are. Once that mark is put on, the gene can be turned off. And it can be turned off for an hour, a day, a month, a lifetime, and sometimes two or three lifetimes. Meaning a mark put on today will be wind up in your children and grandchildren. That's a mark that is permanent and impermanent at the same time. It's a new field of investigation. There's a lot we don't know. And therefore, the idea of identical twins is completely wrong now. Identically, genetically, at the DNA level, but not epigenetically, at the supra-DNA level. So two different twins may look the same, but they will behave the same, they eat different foods, they experience different lifetimes, and they have at the bottom, their epigenome is very different. Another technology that everyone's heard about, I'm sure we'll hear a lot about in the next two days, stem cells. So a stem cell is nothing more then a cell, we'll start with the oocyte, that is completely totipotent, meaning it can make anything. And then it becomes, meaning it, and then it makes what's called a pluripotent cell, which can make almost anything. Pluripotent meaning it can make anything except what preceded it. And now you can make all the tissues of the body. Everything we are comes from a small number of pluripotent cells. Now, there's been a huge ethical debate of embryonic stem cells, and here they are, because to make such a cell, you have to fertilize an egg and make a blastocyst, which is a little bit advanced beyond fertilization, and those are pluripotent cells, and from that, for example, you can make blood cells. That debate was completely a red herring, because you can actually make pluripotent cells these days from another source, not derived from embryos. They're called IPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, which you can take from any cell, for example, a skin cell, and go all the way to here. As of today, these two are not identical cells, but they're pretty close. In about a year or two, I think they'll be very close. Therefore, the necessity to make a human stem cell through this route has been obviated by the ability to make a human stem cell from this root. One last piece of technology, and then I'll end with a little story. Craig Venter is a famous guy. He was a, one of the people to sequence the human genome. He has just published a paper that uh, I guess has been on the front pages of just about every newspaper, called something called synthetic biology. What is synthetic biology? What Craig Venter wants to do, and some other people want to do, is actually take the DNA as we know it and reorganize it in such a way that we can actually create cells that do what we want them to do. And what Craig has done, and his colleagues, is do take the system of PCR that I told you, amplify little segments of DNA, in this time 10,000 bases at a crack, and just stick them together, one, two, three, four, five, and make gigantic chromosomes, and you can appreciate that this piece and this piece and this piece could all encode different kinds of things. Perhaps we could throw one in the Gulf of Mexico to eat all that oil that is uh, polluting uh, the southern coast of the United States. 
If we had a synthetic bacterium that loved oil, we would throw it in there, and we could create a chromosome to do that. That's synthetic biology. We're at the very beginnings of this. We have no idea where this is going to end. There's a lot of debate. That is, this is a source of a lot of debate. I'm going to start, end with a little story. In Jewish tradition, every child has three parents, the mother, the father, and God. I'm going to give you an example where such a child might have four parents, or maybe even five. I work on mitochondria. These are mitochondria. It's orange. That's the second source of DNA inside the cell. That's what they look like. They're very, to me, they're very beautiful. They look like bacteria because they used to be bacteria one day. And they have their own DNA. It has its own genetics. And the genetics is a maternal inheritance. So if the mother has mutations in her mitochondrial DNA, she will pass the mutation to all her children. If the father has a mutation in his mitochondrial DNA, so there he, he'll grow up to be a father, none of it will enter the child. That's called maternal inheritance. And it creates a whole set of different diseases. And the issue is, a mother who is going to have a child, and that child will die in many cases of maternal disease. What if that mother wants to have a normal child? So colleagues of mine in Newcastle upon Tyne in England have developed a procedure to, do, to help that woman. And it's called cytoplasmic transfer. So here's a mother with the mitochondrial disease. And the blue cytoplasm is full of mutated mitochondrial DNAs. You can do IVF, in vitro fertilization, and create, if you will, an IVF zygote. But it has bad mitochondria in the cytoplasm. So, here's a donor, another woman, her egg. We take out the nucleus, and now we have cytoplasm that is, from the mitochondrial standpoint, completely normal. And we fuse this cytoplasm with this nucleus. We take the nucleus out here, stick it into there. And now we have a normal embryo, and this egg, we can now stick back into the uterus of this mother, or we could put it into a surrogate mother. And we get a normal baby, normal nuclear DNA. The nucleus is genetically identical to the parent, except for the few genes. And there are only 37 genes, not 20,000. Very few genes from the mitochondria in the parent, in, in, in the child. Of course, this kind of created a bit of an uproar. When, when my colleagues announced that they were going to do this, immediately uh, the uh, British tabloids had a field day, the baby with two mothers, and if we're a surrogate, it would be three mothers, right? And so I leave you with this as the beginnings of genetics 40, 50 minutes ago, and we come to this place, and the rest of the two days, I hope, will allow you to use this as a jumping point for the next step. I right, thank you.